Thank you so much for having me. Thanks so much. And um, Babs, where's Bab go? Oh, there you are. You're all the way in the back. Thank you so much for once again making this space available um, to us to have me come talk. I, I love talking to this group because uh, you tend to be rapidly passionate about the place where you're living. And that makes it that's so much easier than talking to a bunch of senators and congressmen up in Washington, D.C. Uh, I have to work really hard with those guys, and you're much easier. Um, so I'm, I'm here really to encourage you to uh, leave this talk and go out and enjoy the things that are around us. And um, what I want to talk to you about today um, is the area that we are sitting in right here with uh, Walnut Creek Preserve, the area that you probably are living in now, which is the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment Ecoregion. And I, I, I always, I coined the term and everybody's stolen it and I love it. That's why I do what I do, steal everything I say and everything I do and go out and make something out of it uh, bigger than I ever could, okay? And everybody started using this term that I started to use when we were having the Nature Conservancy was first having um, this uh, uh, meetings that we were trying to get a, a concept together and trying to get a, a, a push ahead to really open our Southern Blue Ridge office up and um, to, to really put a focus on the importance of the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment. I said, my God, it's a crucible of life. And that, that's a crucible of life in so many ways. And so today, I'm going to try to get you to, um, to, to just open your eyes up to what's around you and realize that um, you're part of it, for starters. And even though we go out and we read the landscape, the landscape is reading us at the same time. And we're really a part, like a living, breathing part of what's going on. And you're living and breathing in one of the most important areas for biodiversity in the United States. Okay? So it's a pretty place, too. That doesn't hurt. We're going to be talking about natural communities today. And I, my definition that I use in my class for a natural community, it's an interactive assemblage of organisms, their physical environment, and the natural processes that affect them. Okay? I just broke that down, stealing from other people, too, like Mike Shafley. Mike is an interesting guy. And you guys know Mike? Uh huh. Well, I can do a Mike Shapley impression if you promise not to show it to him on. <laughs> what is it? <clears throat> a distinct and reoccurring assemblage of populations of plants, animals, bacteria, and fungi. Yeah. I think it's a lot easier just to say we have an interactive living and breathing system around us that everything's connected and it's connected to the physical properties of the environment, it's connected to the climate that is a part of the physical property of the environment that we live in, which is completely unique as we're going to see. And they're connected one another in this intricate web um, that is just, to me, beautiful. So. That's what we'll be talking about. So let's think a little bit about that. To understand why the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment is so important, we need to understand why plants grow where they grow. Why was this Eriophorum and this heath growing in this bog outside of Killarney in Ireland where I took this picture? Um, how did they end up there? And why are they able to grow there? And how do they grow together? And do they choose to do that? Or is that just something that's stoichastic that just happens, like my, uh, one of my mentors, Henry Gleason, said? Well, in general, these are the same biotic and abiotic factors that shape communities or what shapes where plants can grow. Plants form the basis of a community, right? So even though we're not just going to talk about plants today, they're kind of the building block of the community. You can't have a, a community center without the cinder blocks forming the, the, the outside, right? You need the plants to form the basis of what's going on because they're primary producers taking sunlight, right, and forming that into everything that powers the ecosystem. Right? right down to our cars and the, and the petrol we put in our cars, which comes from ancient sunlight that hit those plants. And so these two plants you know, are growing there because A, they can't tolerate heat, B, they can't tolerate extreme cold, and C, they're able to tolerate a pH of about 2.6 to 3.2, <laughs> which is what those peat blocks that everybody burns and makes their houses out of in Ireland are, are coming in at. For pH, you know. So, what shapes how why things or where plants can the physical physical environment does, and um, climate is a huge part of that. Okay. So we have in our area, it's a picture from right right here, pretty much. Caesar said, I guess, off of there, um, and it's um, it, it sort of shows you a lot 
when you think about what happens, people travel from all over the world to see this spectacle of color that happens with our trees, you know, because it gets cold here in the wintertime. We think that's why trees change color. Do you know why cheese trees actually became deciduous? Do you know where they became deciduous? Does anybody in here know? Excuse me? It was in the high Arctic and also, again, in the Antarctic. So we have groups of trees. If you go to Chile and, and uh, New Zealand, you can see groups of trees called Nothophagus, which are southern beech. And in the northern hemisphere, you can see Phagus, which are northern beech. They're unrelated trees that, um, that came to opposite sides of the globe. But they all, all of our deciduous trees here um, are deciduous because they had to adapt to growing at a time when the world was much, much warmer because Antarctica and South America hadn't separated and we didn't have the Antarctic current going around Antarctica super chilling the globe. And at that time, the poles were warm. There's only one problem with the poles, and that's that it's dark, completely dark, for at least three months a year. And during that time, imagine having a green leaf. What happens to chlorophyll if you keep put a plant in the closet? Right? So having a green leaf is a real liability, so start shedding it to be able to, to survive on 24 hours of sunlight for three other months of the year, right? Take advantage of all that sun, all that productivity, and grow. And it just so happened that the, the vagaries of our climate over time allowed those trees to have an advantage, a competitive advantage here, where we have shifts in seasons that also give them an advantage during the low light cold times of the year when there's a lot more water stress on leaves because in, in the winter when it's cold and it's dry and it's blowing around and there's less humidity in the air, it's also very difficult to hold leaves, right? So climate. So we have a really unique climate. Now North America is the most volatile of all climates. I love it when people don't care about climate change. <laughs> a, let's settle something right now, stupid argument. If you say there's no such thing as climate change, you're a moron. Okay? Because we know climate's changed in the past. We know New York City was under two kilometers of ice 18,000 years ago. That's not a guess, okay? We know that climate has changed during our recorded history, from the Little Ice Age during the 1700s till now, right? So don't say there's no such a thing as climate, okay? If you don't think carbon dioxide is responsible for climate change, great. You know, there's the laws of physics you have to deal with, with that, but whatever. You know, you can, you can think it's not, not uh, uh, greenhouse gases, that's fine. But don't ever say there's not such a thing as climate change because that's absolutely false, okay? All right, so climate change in the past influences things that we see um, today. And North America is, is more susceptible to climate change than any other continent in the world because we're shaped like a funnel and we have the most volatile, what we call continental climate of any of the continents. We're shaped like a funnel so that in the wintertime, and in the summertime really, but in the wintertime, air can pop right down into the center of the climate and shift. Sturgis, South Dakota saw the highest shift in 24 hours of any place on planet Earth, 140 degrees in a 24 hour period. Life is set in its distribution based upon extremes, not averages. Our continent's more extreme than anywhere else. We happen to live in this wonderful corner of South Carolina, North Carolina, Northeast Georgia, where climate shifts have been shifted in the past, but there's lots of places that don't shift quite so hard. And they're moderated by a number of different things. Continental climate, all you got to do. You ever ever been to eastern Montana or North Dakota? Yeah. All right, yeah, all right. Then you know continental climate, right? And you know why the Great Plains, this is a picture out um, um, in a place called Roundup, South Dakota, really close to, not Roundup, uh, uh, Zor uh, Zortman, uh, Zortman, Montana, excuse me, um, right smack dab in the middle of the Great Plains. And we know why the trees don't grow well in the Great Plains is because they can't deal with the extremes as the average trees should be able to grow just fine. But the fact that a couple years you'll have rainfall is so low that trees can't grow out of 20 years that are great for tree growth limits the tree's growth, right? Kind of why we don't have them there. And that's why grasses are there because grasses put almost all their biomass under ground so the top can die and they can pop right back up when conditions restore, right? 
we have the opposite situation here. We don't have grasses, which tells us that, at least during the recent history, as old as those trees are out in the landscape, and as long as we can push back the trees being there, we've had sufficient and dependable rainfall to really accommodate for that. Now, we'll tell you at the South Carolina Botanical Garden, we've been collecting uh, weather records since the 1970s. Last year, we had 4.7 inches of rain during the growing season. From April 1st to November uh, 1st, we had 4.7 inches of rain. In 2013, we had 104 inches of rain during the same period. We are getting more extreme, right? We've seen it here. And we're seeing actual shifts in the forest habitats with red oaks and hickories dying. Have you noticed that? All over the place. If you have a yard that has a lot of trees, and I'm sure you've had a red oak or a hickory die in the past 10 years, and that's strictly due to the vagaries of weather and the fact that those trees are shallow rooted. Um, so do averages determine the ranges of limits? Our average temperature hasn't really changed that much. Our average rainfall hasn't changed that much because when you average 4.7 and 103 to get 104 together, you do end up with, oh, we get 47 inches of rain a year in Clemson, right? But the extremes determine range limits, don't they? This is a picture I took in San Francisco just last summer. San Francisco's average temperature for the year is 57 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Asheville, North Carolina's average temperature is 57 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> Do you think it's the averages that determine where plants can grow? No. That snow would have killed those date palms right off the bat. We don't have to go any further than looking at the distribution of where plants grow today to see the impact of the past on the distribution of plants today. In South Carolina, North Carolina, what's your state tree in North Carolina? Do you know? Don't. State flower. No, oh, longly pine, right, longly pine. Y'all are real smart. Now, I happen to have grown up in North Carolina, so we're real smart in North Carolina. We chose an actual tree for our, our uh, state tree. And in South Carolina, they chose not a tree to be their state tree, the palmetto, which is not a true tree. Hey, I'm South Carolinian today for a long time. We, uh, we're not last. We're 49th in education, so we're... Um, what is it? We, we have a saying, thank God for Alabama, right? So, um, no, but it is a wonderful symbol for us because it's a symbol of uh, resistance. It, was, it, it, it um, reinforced like, uh, Fort Moultrie during the American Revolution. That's how it ended up on, on our flag and it's one of our symbols in our state tree. It's tree-ish, so I guess it counts. But look at the distribution. It only grows naturally from Brunswick County, uh, North Carolina, right along the outer fringe of the coast, down into Florida and over into Alabama. Over into, uh, Alabama. Now, have you seen them growing in Columbia, South Carolina? Have you seen them growing in Columbia, South Carolina? Yeah, they grow just fine in Columbia. They grow just fine in Columbia. Why don't they grow there naturally? Because in the past, it's been too cold for them to grow there. And their range is still in recovery. Right? Right, yeah, they reproduce fine on their own in Columbia, but they just haven't grown there. So what happened in the past still influences, uh, extremes in the past, it still influences distribution of plants today. We also have a lot of vagaries in our climate because of oscillation systems. Um, the, decadal, the Pacific oscillation system between La Niña's and, and El Niño's has a profound impact on changing averages, <laughs> on changing extremes, excuse me. So when we have La Niña years, we have an, a huge influx of water in, of, of water vapor that comes in off the Atlantic during those times because two low pressure systems set up when El Ninos are present, or La Ninas are present in the Pacific, and that brings lots and lots of rain to us. Um, in El Nino years, which we had one back in 2015, um, 15 through 16, uh, the strongest ever recorded. Um, I took a trip to the Galapagos Islands during that time and all of the, the animals were all starving to death because there was no upwelling of, of um, nutrients in the current. So when I did my UTV trip, we were able to really talk about that, but it was pretty pathetic to see these skeletons of marine iguanas on beaches I'd seen, you know, healthy ones on before. Um, so that has impacts everywhere. And during El Nino years, we get an influx from the Gulf because a persistent low pressure system sets up over the North Great, Northern Great Plains. And in 2015, my son was working on the American Prairie Reserve in Montana. And there was so much rain that year that when cactus grow, there was four inches of water on the ground all year. And you nearly got exsanguinated by mosquitoes just walking across the prairie. Okay? So these things bring real extremes, too. And chance. 
is uh, nearly just as important as anything else when we're talking about where plants are found. It's, it's the extremes of climate, but it's also chance. This is a little fern that in North America is only known from one place in the Jocassee Gorges in East Otoe Gorge down just below the mountain here in Pickens County, South Carolina, where it was discovered in 1937 by Doc Totten um, and um, Coker, and it, uh, it grew there for years and years and years, and the closest place that it grows to Pickens County, South Carolina, is Jamaica. It's a tropical fern, but it's called Tunbridge fern. Do anybody ever been to Tunbridge Well in southwestern England? It's another little weird place that has a kind of a moderated climate, and this fern managed to make its way there. Now, how did it make its way? England, Jamaica, all throughout the Neotropics, all throughout the African tropics. Why is it in those places, and how did it get back and forth and all around? Winds, not ships, but winds. Because ferns don't have big, heavy seeds. What do they reproduce with? Spores. And the spores can get in upper air currents, and particularly spores that are generated in West Africa sometimes catch air currents that ride across the subtropic ridge and up into North America and get dropped with what kind of weather systems? Hurricanes, right. Right, so ferns can pretty much are shedding their spores all over the globe all the time, and they just have to find, by chance, that right little rock that produces just the right conditions. Rock and soil, we call it daphic factors in, in ecology, are really important. You know, nutrients, the chemistry, that's so important in what we, what we see and what plants can grow in, and we'll see that when we talk specifically about our area. And then slope and aspect. Now, slope is how steep something is, because the steeper it is, the quicker it Right? But also aspect. Aspect is which way you're facing. So I love this. This is a place I always take. I take this picture every time I go out to this place. It's in Big Sur, California. And um, on this slope is facing due south, and this slope is facing due north. The north-facing slope is protected from the heat of the persistent sun during the daytime, and the south-facing slope is just blasted with sunlight all during the day. So on this side, we have yuccas and desert grasses. And on this side, we have redwoods. Right? Just based on where it goes. And of course, something else that determines climate greatly is the ocean. So, see, here's the same slope facing south, desert, this slope, redwood. And then over here, because it's facing the Pacific and it's bathed in mist, because the oceans bring us the evaporated water that falls as condensation or rain, right? So the proximity to the ocean is also something. The ocean temperature is also something. If you ever get a chance to go to that place, go to it. It's like a fairy tale. So it's called Julia Pfeiffer Burns State Park. It's in um, Big Sur, California. Great. So let's bring it home and talk about the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment in context. I want you to know where it is, OK? So it runs basically from up here, Hickory Nut Gorge area, um, southeast of Asheville, all the way down into Rabin County and Haversham County, Georgia. Um, encompassing this whole area where you move from Piedmont to mountain, okay? So it's a narrow area we're talking about. It's not everywhere, okay? It's not the Great Smoky Mountains, um, which is my number one nemesis when I talk about this because everybody thinks the Smokies are so great and they drive through our area to get to the Smokies and they don't realize they're missing the best stuff on their way over, right? So that's the area we're talking about. This area has, is blessed because the mountains, and you'll notice this here, the Blue Ridge Mountains run all the way from the tip of the Gaspé Peninsula up in Quebec, all the way down to this part of North Carolina, right here, where we sit right today. See, this is Saluda right there, okay? So right where we sit today. They're running north, northeast to south, southwest. And they come down here and they do something really weird. They hook, they go, and suddenly you have an east-west running ridge across there. So we have two main sources of water vapor coming from the ocean. This red's supposed to represent the Gulf Stream, warm water off there. Warm water carries a lot of moisture inland, and when it cools as it goes up over the mountains, it falls. So if we have onshore currents off the Atlantic, guess what happens in La Nina years? Torrential rainfall, right? During the winter time, this, the, um, lows, uh, the uh, jet stream comes down, and a lot of times you'll see it dip like that. If you ever want to know if we're really going to have a big snowstorm, all you got to look for is the hook in the jet stream. You've seen that? 
when it hooks over the, the gulf, there's lots of moisture. When it's coming like this, Alberta Clipper down from here and pulling those polar vortexes down, you see all that snow coming like, it's gonna snow, it's gonna snow. When is the weatherman gonna learn that all the snow evaporates off of the, by the time it crests over the Great Smoky Mountains and it doesn't know nothing over here? You know? Every time they call for snow, I mean, I've known this from when I was a kid, if the, if the if jet stream is coming straight down like that, it is not going to snow much here. You may get a flake or two, but it's going to snow like crazy in Gatlinburg, and over here it's not, because all the snow is falling on that side of the mountain. We do have a leeward side, okay? But in the wintertime, frequently, our temperature jet stream is coming right over the gulf and bringing up that moisture, and that moisture wouldn't fall torrentially on a mountain range that's running like this, but it picks up all of it in a mountain range that's running east-west, north-south. So we take it all when that jet stream pops over the gulf like that and it dumps here. And that happens a lot, at least historically. So our area has more rainfall. Yeah, when we look out into that, that incredible space that it, people call the blue wall, my friend Tommy Weiss called it the blue wall and I call it um, the Blue Highway, because it's, it's more of gorges that go up into the mountains that bring diversity in and out than anything else. The highest rainfall in eastern North America is found, recorded at Bad Creek Station, which is right here on the North Carolina, South Carolina 9, near Whitewater um, Falls. It's the highest rainfall recorded in eastern North America on average, right? Because of those very things we just talked about. Now, what does water do? We have lots of water. It does a couple things. One, it makes lots of water, right? So it allows you to have water available most years, but it does something else too. Uh-huh, frees up minerals. It does lots of other things. What's it do to the climate, climate though, that we're talking about? Why is, is North Dakota and Montana so volatile and we're not as volatile here? Humidity. Yeah, cloud cover, when there's cloud cover at night, right, in the wintertime, it doesn't, you're not able to radiate off the heat and you don't, you don't cool as, as ridiculously fast. And the latent heat of evaporation of water itself raises the local um, uh, temperature right around an evaporating water body, okay? So water helps to moderate the climate. So remember I said the natural communities are interactive. I don't want us to forget about this part. That's why it's in red there. They're interactive. They're all connected together and connected right to our life. So let's look at one of these. Um, this is a, a fish that's really common in the streams um, that are Atlantic drainage that go down into, um, well, the streams right here on this property. Anything that drains into the Green River, the Broad River, uh, or the Savannah River will have this species of fish in it, right? This is um, a fish which got the unfortunate name here. This is a Broad River population, which are the ones you have here, that have whitish colored fins, has the unfortunate name of yellowfin shiner. <laughs> So if you go out to these streams, late April through all of May and into June even up here in North Carolina, you'll see these writhing red masses of these shiners in this subsection hydroflox, and they're all there on top of these little stone nests, right? These, these are greenheads from the Catawba River Basin, which is just north of us here, um, but same group of shiners. And if you look here, there's not just them, but here's rosy-sided dace, and then there's all these things with the larger, with these black stripe, and then look at this guy. What we call, used to call a horny head when I was a kid fishing the streams in Allegheny County. Blue head chub with those uh, nuchal tubercles that he has, those breeding tubercles up there. He builds this nest, and since he's the biggest, baddest minnow in the creek, he's able to guard it against red-eyed bass, coosa bass, bartrams bass, uh, in these waters, rock bass up here in these waters, and these redfish are coming over top of that nest that's built and maintained by him and guarded by him to lay their eggs, and they won't lay their eggs anywhere except on a bluehead chub nest. Matter of fact, almost all the minnows in our streams around here, small streams, only breed on chub nests for a couple reasons. One, the nest is clean, silt-free, which is important. It's elevated and has good oxygen flow, which is important. But the best part of all, free childcare. <laughs> free childcare, right? Because the, the bluehead chub is gonna guard your babies that you've laid in his nest. And those minnows color up bright red. Those are the same minnows we fish with, the little silver things, shiners. But they're silver all year long until it comes breeding season and they pump up 
and turn into these brilliant red creatures to attract the females. And all those were competing males, and a female will come into the nest and choose the brightest colored male who has the best spot, and he's the one who gets to inseminate most of the eggs. All those other males are sneaky males, and the minute she starts breeding, they just, everybody sheds <laughs> semen in the water, and there's a lot of mixing going on. But sneaky males and the, and the dominant male, but the dominant male is the closest to the female, so he gets the best chance of, of fertilizing her eggs. So guess what? If we lost one species from our stream, if we lost that bluehead chub, what would happen to the shiners? And you'd see a collapse of the whole system, right? So what if we're not real careful with the way we maintain our yards and we throw a bunch of toxic things that can go wash into the streams, be a runoff, or if we have a lot of development in headwater streams, if we exceed about 30% of your land being paved, for instance, the quality of your stream drops to zero and you can't support bluehead chubs, what's happened to the stream? The whole system collapses. Right? And this has ramifications on us too, because if you, like, if you live where I live, where yellowfin shiners are, then you're going you're, you're gonna to depend on, we depend on hugely, Lake Hartwell and the Bassmasters Classic for our um, income for at least one weekend a year. Right? Where millions of dollars are pumped into Anderson County, where I live. Okay? And without the bluehead chub, we don't have that. So do you see how intricate that is? See how cool that is? Here's the yellowfin, the actual yellowfin variety, just so you can see that they do the same thing. But there's lots of species that do this. Um, um, this is very similar to the ones we have here in this range, except their fins aren't really orange. This is, again, yellowfin, but in Clemson, orange. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> and if you go just... If, Oh, the model. The model was Jeff Smith. He was, uh, he's a, was an aquarist up at the North Carolina State Museum in Raleigh. He took my position. I used to be the aquarist there, and he, he took my position there. This is just uh, a couple, this is where I get what the streams look like there. It's every stream. It's not special about one stream. All the streams in the Blue Ridge have these fish. In this case, that's red lip shiners and mountain red belly dace that are breeding over a central stone roller nest. Isn't that beautiful? Really pretty thing. All right. So, interactive. Also, when we look at flowers, and you, you, you often think about the plants as providing food in terms of things eating the plants, right? But they provide other sources of energy, right? Other than just their leaves and their fruit. What is this plant producing that is going to be used by somebody? Pollen, yeah. Pollen, nectar from these plants um, to feed pollinators, right? Now, a lot of people are shocked to hear me say, I don't care what happens to honeybees. They can go extinct. It doesn't bother me at all. Don't care. They're not native. Not a single one of our plants co-adapted with, with honeybees um, and depends on honeybees. Our native plants depend on native pollinators originally, and in some cases, honeybees have come in and taken the place of those native pollinators. But honeybees are invasive exotics in North America, just like kudzu and, okay. Bumblebees pollinate this plant, and I know bumblebees pollinate this plant if I didn't know never bumblebee go to that plant, I would know that's a bumblebee pollinated plant because of the shape of the flowers. The petals are bent backwards, the anthers are stuck outwards, and they look like a drinking straw. They're rolled up and all of the pollens on the inside of the, the outside, and it's only that sticky pollen can only be shot out the end of that straw to be available for the bee through a process called buzz pollination or sonication that's done by bumblebees. Tomatoes have flowers that look exactly like this. Watch your tomatoes. They're pollinated by bumblebees and carpenter bees. And what happens is the, the female bee goes up, she grabs a hold of those anthers, and she shakes, wiggles her hips like Elvis. <laughs> and she does it at, it, it's a vibration that she makes, which makes a hum that's different from the hum when they're flying, which is a vibration of 300 times a minute that she's rubbing her thorax and abdomen together there to create a hum that is the exact right frequency to burst that pollen out the end of the tube. Yeah. Crazy. If we lost honeybees, would our food crops still be pollinated? No. That's some reason to be concerned about honeybees, because things like almonds out in California require honeybees. Um, pollination, because our native bees don't really do the trick. Right. Right. So. Um, Lion's turtle head um, is a common plant right here in the drainage that's around Green River. You see this plant, don't you? It's getting, it's blooming right now, actually. Um, and what pollinates that plant? 
Well, as an ecologist, I know just by the shape of the flower. It's called turtle head because it looks like a turtle's face, right? And I always, when I was a kid, even before I knew it was a turtle head, was the name. I used to squeeze the sides and make it talk. Because <laughs> you can open it up and down. But it has this lip. It's a bilabiate flower. The, and things with bilabiate flowers are also usually in our area pollinated by carpenter bees and honeybees because they have these great big flowers, tubular, that require activity on the part of the pollinator to properly pollinate it. You have to be heavy enough to cause the lip to go down to get inside the flower. Can they sleep in there? They will, yes, if they're in there late in the day, like in your foxgloves, digitalis, which are pollinated originally by European honeybees, or uh, bumblebees. Here, they're pollinated by our bumblebees, and some, a lot of times when I was a kid, I'd wake up in the morning, there'd be a sleeping bumblebee inside the, <laughs> the thing. And I never learned that if you, I, I always thought I could trap them in there by closing the end and pulling them out. I never learned that I would get stung <laughs> every time. I still did it. All right, tell me about this plant. You guys are ecologists now. What do you think pollinates red flowers that are held out away from the plant from any landing platform? There's only one group of critters in the world that pollinates red tubular flowers that are held away from. Oh, right. And you know, you can tell an old world bird pollinated plant from a new world plant because hummingbirds are only here in the new world, they're not in the old world. In the old world, there's lots of red tubular flowers, but they have landing platforms for sunbirds, which are the old world version of a hummingbird to pollinate them. We um, won an Emmy for this show, actually, too. We uh, still have the highest speed footage that's ever been shot of hummingbirds, and we were able to observe behaviors that have never been observed in hummingbirds before. And it, it's a great way to show you why hummingbirds and plants have co-adapted together. Um, one, thing, one thing we were able to see when we slowed this stuff down, there's a lot of cat fights going on. And if you ever wonder why female hummingbirds always have a couple feathers stuck up like this, it's because they, they're continually doing this, and people hadn't really noticed that. That's male-on-male -male aggression. The female pull each other's hair, and the male just chases the female off. But look at the females doing something no other bird on Earth can do. She's flying upside down and backwards. And the longest, the longest clip you're going to see here is one twentieth of one second long. We filmed this at 6,400 frames per second, and this male hummingbird is showing you very nicely why hummingbirds are able to do this. There's a drop of water right there. I don't know if you can see it. Okay? They're flapping their wings 200 times per second. That drop of water has gone nowhere, have you noticed? <laughs> so, um, they're able to do that because they're the only thing on Earth that produces lift in the downstroke and the upstroke wings, and that allows them to hover. They're the only bird on Earth that can hover, and so they can reach flowers that don't have any landing platform, and because red is a coloration that attracts birds, these red tubular flowers that place their flowers away from a landing platform, we know are co-adapted to hummingbirds. Isn't that wonderful? And these little tiny birds that do these amazing things that weigh less than a dime, a lot less than a dime weighs, they packed and change the world themselves because every time they stick their nose into a flower, right, they're pollinating and they're moving genes and they can visit one flowers in their lifetime. Something that small has shaped the world by, by moving the color, moving the structure that we see in the world to be a perfect relationship with that plant, right? Isn't that fascinating? This isn't a big thing. This is a little thing we're talking about that's shaped the Southern Blue Ridge around us. Okay, now, food also, right? We know that um, the more diversity of plants you have, generally, the more diversity of insects you have. The more diversity of insects you have, the more diversity of birds you have. The more birds you have, right? Okay, it goes right up the trophic uh, system, right? So this is a um, species of caterpillar that only feeds on maypops, on passion vines, passion flowers, right? Anybody recognize that? Gulf fritillary, oh. right. Monarchs, what do monarchs feed only on? Milkweeds, right. Yeah. But there's your Gulf fritillary, which we're on the edge. And the great thing about the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment is, if you go to Allegheny County where I grew up, which we are in the Blue Ridge Escarpment, but we're not in the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment, we don't have variegated fritillaries. We don't have Gulf fritillaries. We have Beloria, we have bog fritillaries and great spangles. But here you have it all. You have the stuff from farther south that creeps up to the edge of the mountains here, and you have the stuff that's from up north that's able to survive because of the moderate climate that we have. So we have a lot more. Um, I love these two. These are great. Um, the one on the left tries to look like a, um, 
uh, like a snake, and it only feeds on spice spinach. So you know what? If you want to support the natural variety we see in the southern Blue Ridge by having spice bush swallowtails around, you have to plant spice bush, which aren't the most attractive bush in the world, but they're the only food for spice bush swallowtails. And if you want to see those caterpillars, you've got to have the spice bush. This one over here is pipe vine swallowtail, another plant you probably wouldn't plant in your landscape because it's kind of not that attractive. It grows like kudzu and has a flower that is not very bit large. It looks like a little Dutchman's pipe. This one protects itself by looking like a snake. This one has osmeteria. It has these, well, all, all swallowtails do, but it has these big giant orange osmeteria that sticks out and it secretes this horrible smelling toxic um, <laughs> gas that smells like a big, like somebody let a big one go. Um, and it scares things that might get it. There's another strategy that some swallowtails apply, and this is taken in the southern Blue Ridge Escarpment, but only because we have a lot of hop tree in the area um, where this was taken. This only feeds on, on plants in the citrus family, hop tree and prickly ashes um, being uh, some of them. Um, and this one was taken on a prickly ash tree that um, uh, Sam and Eva Pratt gave me right over here. So um, this, one, this one's defensive strategy is a giant swallowtail. The defensive strategies look like bird poop. Because you don't want to eat a snake, you don't want to eat something stinky, and you sure don't want to eat bird poop, right? Yeah, but it turns into that giant, the largest of all of our swallowtails. Variety of host plants, specialty nurseries. Um, one of the best places to get, um, if you're looking for local genotype host plants for our um, butterflies, is at the spring and fall plant sales at the South Carolina Botanical Garden. But also the South Carolina Native Plant Society, the uh, UNC Charlotte Botanical Garden, the Asheville over Nashville, the North Carolina Arboretum are great places. Support your local um, garden. We try to do the right thing, all of us, at least that I just listed, are trying to do the right thing by providing plants like that, okay? So, pretty cool when we look at how that diversity uh, conflagrates, but then also, history can't be ignored and our history can't be ignored in what's going on. We've already talked about that with climatic history, but a lot of times we tend to think that the extent of our influence on the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment, or in South Carolina, as, uh, as this picture uh, sort of illustrates, we tend to think it as the beginning of our influence on our ecosystem as being the foundation of Charleston on, in South Carolina, which, you know, which Charleston was founded and then on the seventh day God rested. It's kind of what we say. Um, <laughs> because everybody thinks that that's when the world started in South Carolina. But um, the, uh, we, we generally tend to think about um, the European influence as being the time when um, we really started to modify our habitat. And we know that is to be false, of course, today. We can remember certain habitats and explain the distribution only as far back as our history takes us, right? So this is a picture from East Texas of longleaf pine um, and these giant longleaf pine with grassy understories. We know that they existed all across as the dominant um, ground cover over the uplands of the southeastern coastal plain from Texas to Virginia. Um, and we know why they were there, because we have good pictures that allow us to see that. But when we look at the distribution of some of the plants, the more odd plants that grow in the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment and the Upper Piedmont, we're kind of at a loss to understand where they were, at least until rather recently. So this is Helianthus schweinitzii, named after a guy named Von Schweinitz, who lived in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And um, it's a, 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 a member of what we call the Piedmont Prairie Ecosystem, right? A prairie ecosystem that we used to, we thought, well, maybe there were prairies because the distribution of this plant around Charlotte, we still have prairie-like uh, habitats around Charlotte, so there must have been a prairie. And we have old maps that show a grand savanna around Charlotte, Rock Hill, and up in towards um, Iredale County, North Carolina, that, that show us this great prairie. But if you go back farther, you find out that this great prairie extended from the Gulf Coastal Plain all the way into New England. And we have to go back way far, and I've been involved in some of the research that's gone back way far. Um, my wife would tell you, my man crush is Mark Cates. I do have a man crush. She's been dead for 270 some years, so it's all right. She's not too jealous. But most people know Mark Catesby because of his beautiful watercolors, which are on display right now at the Gibbs Museum in Charleston. If you don't go see it, you're going to miss something. Those things are housed in Windsor Castle, and not everybody has 
like me, can just go to Windsor Castle. I just go to Windsor Castle because I've studied these things. But you, you, know, you need to go see them while they're at the Gibson Museum. It's amazing. And he wrote this book, The Natural History of Carolina, Florida, and the Bahama Islands. And it tells us a lot about how the world has changed since 1722 to 1724 when he came here. Let me show you a couple birds here. This one's a Baltimore Oriole. Loves to live in backyards. We got lots of them up at my old home in Allegheny County, North Carolina, breeding there. In the winter, they come to the, to the coastal plain of Carolina. The lark, but, um, the, the uh, Oriole's a savanna bird, likes backyards. The eastern meadow lark likes places people have really screwed up, um, cow pastures, uh, agricultural land, um, what we call early successional habitats, clear cuts, those kind of things. Um, this is an oven bird, has a beautiful voice if we had sound here, and scarlet tanager. Both of those require old growth forests. The oven bird, 280 acres of old growth forest to produce one successful nest of young, 80 plus year old trees, uninterrupted by one road. If one road goes through that 280 acres, they won't successfully breed. The tanager around 100 to 120 consecutive, uh, conti uh, continuous acres of older growth forest to successfully produce one nest of young. So, which one of these groups do you think has changed the most since Catesby's time? Which one of these groups is doing the worst? Which one's doing the best? How many of you guys think it's the backyard birds because we don't have any backyards? Okay, how many of you guys think that the uh, clear cut Cow pasture birds are the ones. Bailey does, bad things, okay, a couple of you do. How many of you guys say go grow forest? Everybody who listens to anybody in the southern Appalachians talk about great our forest oxes, it's old growth forest birds, right? It's not. It's the birds that occupy the landscape that humans have the strongest hand in that are doing the worst. Our grassland birds are doing worse, not just here in the southeastern United States, but everywhere around the world as an ecological guild, grassland birds are in decline. Species like the eastern meadowlark that was the most common bird sound I heard when I was a kid, um, pretty much disappeared from Allegheny County, North Carolina um, in that 40 some, I won't tell you how many year um, span of time. Okay? And the reason that happened is because we went from having a county that was almost entirely dairy farms and, and tobacco to a county that was almost entirely Christmas trees to a county that was almost entirely retirees. Right? Not really. We're really lucky up in Allegheny County. We did find out, though, that retirees are the best crop to grow. They definitely are the most profitable crop to grow. But um, not really. But we did. Um, and now... It's kind of amazing because like I, we, we have a, about 100 and 126 acres in Allegheny County that was formerly in Christmas trees. We finally got the Christmas trees off of it and we've got cattle back on it. And now, guess what showed back up? Meadowlarks. So changes in our, in our lifestyles over the years have really impacted those birds. Now, why are these birds in such decline? The meadowlarks in, uh, declined over 90%, about 90% over 50% of its range in the last 50 years. Why are they in such decline? How many of you guys grow all your own meat? No? All your own vegetables? Okay. Yeah, a couple of you. Good, good. But if I asked that, that question 100 years ago, everybody's hands have gone up, right? It's our lifestyle change. And not just our lifestyle, but people's lifestyles before us. Now, Mark Catesby visited the Carolinas when 1722 to 1724. And at that time, the English settlements only extended inward, inland uh, 60 miles from the coast. And beyond that was what you used to put us see on maps here to be monsters, right? <laughs> These were lands that were controlled by the Creek and the Cherokee Indians up here in this part of the world. And so when Catesby came up here, and the reason he's my man crush is he twice walked to the southern Blue Ridge at Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment in 1723 and then 1724, okay, from Charleston Wall, with Indian guides up the Savannah River, um, across the Savannah River in Georgia, back across in North Augusta, and then right up Highway 28 into Clemson. Really cool. And he tells us a lot about what, um, what this part of the world is about if you bother to read his appendix in the, in the uh, natural history, which I'd highly recommend you read if you want to find out about this area. When we talk about what is natural, well, we look at what he, what he saw here. He saw things like cowbirds. Cowbirds, we thought, weren't native here. We thought they invaded from the West in the 1950s, and we hate them because they lay their eggs in the nests of other birds, and the song sparrows and the, and the Bachman's warblers and everything, they, would, you know, they just would spit out the, the uh, eggs of those birds and replace them with cowbirds. But Catesby only visited South Carolina and Virginia and Georgia. He didn't go out west, but he drew a cowbird. He talked about the cowpin bird. 
Those birds developed that lifestyle because they follow around buffalo, okay? Now, of course, there were no buffalo here, right? But there were. Not the eastern buffalo, it's a plains buffalo. Uh, they lived in the eastern United States, but a lot of people are under the misconception that's a woodland bison. It's not. Those were just Alaska and Canada. And our bison here were a relatively recent push into our area from the Great Plains, probably following the demise of the Native American populations around 1500 from smallpox that, that um, lowered the population and allowed a recovery of bison populations, not just in the west, but allowed them to push all the way to the Atlantic coast and down into central Florida. So Mark Catesby drew a bison based upon bison he was eating that his Native American guides we're seeing in, in, and killing for him in the heat of the day when they sought refuge in the cane breaks. And in the cool parts of the day, they were out in the vast savannas because they didn't have the word for prairie yet. But he tells us it's treeless because he says his Indian guides had to hunt him during the heat of the day because if you shot a buffalo and it got mad, it would kill you if there were no trees to hide behind. And there were no trees in the uplands around Clemson where he was describing to hide behind. There was only these giant bamboo thickets along the streams that, that ran up into the great valleys of our southern Blue Ridge Escarpment, like East Detoe and Jocassi, that provided a place where they could shoot them and hide in the bamboo to keep from getting killed. Now, is that the southern Blue Ridge Escarpment you're understanding? It's different. It's different. And our ridges here were different, too. If you want to read that, it's, it's an interesting thing. But this was more likely the habitat rather than forest in the Clemson area. And also on low slopes at the bases of our, our mountains and these big vast valleys that occur in the Appalachians also we know were populated with bison and elk. And the, the grassy balds were probably populated by bison and elk. So a lot of the grass that we've lost. Now what, what did we do? Um, we tend to think of our forefathers coming in and clearing all the land in the, in the South Carolina, edge of the South Carolina Blue Ridge Escarpment uh, of trees and planting cotton, but it turns out they cleared the land, they took advantage of the four feet of uh, topsoil that was present in the area, the dark, deep, dark, rich black soil that was there, which is what we all have in our backyards today, right? <laughs> And they planted cotton, and they planted rice, and they planted corn, and they planted wheat, and they did nothing to protect the soil. We washed away the four feet of soil. We lost the, the cotton. And here at the edge of the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment, I managed 17,500 acres that in 1931 looked like that. Badlands, because all the soil had been washed away. And whether the boll weevil had come or not, cotton was finished, because the soil resource had not been conserved. And we threw away about 18,000 years worth of cotton. We abandoned the land, we moved into mill towns and started working in mills. And um, we reforested, what we called reforested land. What we didn't realize is we weren't reforesting, we were foresting, we were terrascaping. We were, we were like Dr. Spock, <laughs> changing the landscape to be forest. Probably hadn't been forest for 18,000 years in those areas, okay? Now I'm talking about a very small proportion of this area, but a lot of what's at the base of the mountains as you come up into North Carolina from South Carolina, okay? And today we see this and we think of it as natural, but is it really natural? Well, yes. Okay, what was natural? <laughs> were the prairies natural? Well, why were the prairies there? We know why the prairies were there. If we go back here, we can see. He said, I visited them again to get the proper seeds because he was more concerned about the tree than, the, um, than the, the bison. He said, the ravaging Indians had burned the woods many miles round. The Native Americans were burning to create that grass, to create those bison, to create the food that would create a quality of life for their people. All right? Same thing we do today, except we do it without burning and eating buffalo. I'm a proponent of going back to the burning and eating buffalo part. <laughs> so he also describes grass higher than his horse's head. You think it's ridiculous. We have a virgin soil site in the South Carolina Botanical Garden that still has the grassland soil. And just by chance, the Botanical Garden ended up on this patch of land that had been John C. Calhoun's cattle ranch that became Clemson, Thomas Green Clemson's cattle ranch that became Clemson University's cattle ranch that then had a few fruit trees planted on it and never got sliced by the plow. And so we have a site with four feet of deep, dark, rich grassland soil that we've restored a prairie on. And just like the Native Americans, we burn it every spring. And that's, that is a fire that is as hot and high as the conflagrations of the ninth level of hell itself. It's amazing. It burns in two minutes. Six acres and uh, prairie we put in burns in two minutes. 
It is. The grasses themselves. Right, so the grasses themselves provide the, this unique soil called a mollusol. It's a, it's a grassland soil, a soft soil. So if you've ever been to the Midwest, to Iowa or Illinois or, or Indiana and seen those dark black soils that are really soft and when you squish them together they bounce right back out, we call those mollusols. And we have one of those at the South Carolina Botanical Garden, the only one we know of really in the whole Carolinas. And we've been able to bring back this, this habitat on a really small level, but it's something that's completely gone from our memory, but it still has remnants that creep their way all the way up into the southern Appalachians. A few species that grow today in pine oak heaths, which today are, are just full of mountain laurel and rhododendron, gorge rhododendron, um, underneath pitch pines and table mountain pines and shortleaf pines and uh, scarlet oak and chestnut oak, we'll find a few rosebud orchids or turkey beards growing in those type of habitats, struggling. They're fire maintained plants that are ghosts of that past community that had scattered trees and lots of grass and frequent fire from the activities of, of natural lightning strike fires and Native Americans. So when we think about the, how important people have been, people burned the prairie so the prairie was dependent on people. People turned Oh, and of the cotton, so the cotton was dependent on the people. People have kept fire out of these sites, so the forest is dependent on people. So for the last 18,000 years in that particular habitat, people have been driving forests. Crazy. So we think about the choices we made recently and how important we can be, you know, Hemlock adelgid has killed off lots of hemlocks all throughout the southern Appalachians, right? Almost all of them. It's essentially an ecologically extinct species like chestnut these days. And of course, chestnut was killed off by cryphonecteria for the, by the, the um, blight, the, the um, chestnut blight. And this problem that we have with our hemlocks was made because the director of the New York Botanical Garden decided it would be a great idea to have Asian hemlocks brought in that had the Asian insect that causes the death. This problem with American chestnut was because the director at the New York Botanical Garden thought it was a great idea <laughs> to bring in Asian, Eurasian chestnuts that were infected with the Eurasian disease that wiped out our chestnuts in the 1920s and 30s. Moral of the story is we're powerful, but the real moral of the story is everything bad starts in the Bronx. <laughs> Being a botanical garden director has a huge weight on your shoulder because so many of the diseases that have really transformed this continent, they really have come in through your and my actions of what we want to plant in our backyard. Yep. Did they not know when they bought those? Mm -mm. They did not know. No. no. They didn't know. But, you know, how many plants come into the United States every year as new introductions from China and Japan, right? Every one of them has the potential to be bringing in a disease or becoming the next Chinese privet or Japanese honeysuckle or kudzu. Every one has the potential because our, our climates are so similar. That's another talk. Um, patterns of diversity here. I'm really lucky. I get to go everywhere and I get paid for it. It's really awesome. Um, I just got back from Chile, which is a place where I, I spent most of four years of my life in Chile and um, really connected to the southern Valdivian rainforest ecosystem in Chile and the, and the um, conservation of it similar things. That's a lobelia, kind of like our cardinal flower, but it's a tree called tupa. It's a beautiful forest. Uh, it's rainforest. And I did a lot of work there. I did a tour for the president of Chile and the governor of the region and a senator. And the governor, Patricio Vallespin, is a good friend of mine still. And, and Michelle Bachelet is now the president again of Chile. Um, and when I got done doing the tour, the president of Chile comes up to me and she says, we have two properties that are new that we really need to get surveyed. We want you to do the survey, okay? You know how many plants I knew in Chile at the time? Two, <laughs> dandelion and cudweed. <laughs> All I had done is a tour about the families of plants I was seeing. I had no idea this was a koi kopi way. I had no idea what it was at the time. And she thought I was so charismatic that, you know, you should do it. You obviously have more knowledge than the Chilean. Which, so what do you say to the president when she says, do this? <laughs> yes, ma'am. So we did it. Um, I had to learn, um, I had to learn all the species of plants in Chile on my way down there. Um, <laughs> there were 574 species uh, of vascular plants in that, in that region, in the southern 
this is the southern temperate rainforest of South America. There's 574 species of plants. I learned them on the flight there. <laughs> no kidding. It sounds like a huge feat, a huge number. I had to learn 572. Remember, I already knew dandelion and cudweed. <laughs> but um, it wasn't tough for me. And this is the point. That number sounds huge to me, but I live in a place that has way more diversity than that in a way smaller area. Don't forget the diversity we have right here in our own backyard. We have 1,392 species in Pickens County, South Carolina. 1,392 in Pickens County, South Carolina. Yeah, probably. In Buncombe County, next county north from here, over 2,000 species of plants. So we have four times the diversity in a single county, almost four times the diversity in a single county than in the entire region, the entire ecosystem in southern South America. And when I was a kid, all I could do was dream of getting away from Allegheny County to somewhere like that. <laughs> Allegheny County has over 1,600 species of plants. Isn't that something? So we know, we see the diversity, and we notice a lot of it, right? Some of it we don't notice so much, right? Those are all here. Those are all pictures taken in the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment, right? Gentianopsis crinida, known from one location in the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment. It's a gentian, fringed gentian. It has a very unusual affinity to what we call ultramafic soils. So really high magnesium soils um, are where it grows. So only in a few spots, and I won't tell you where I took that picture because you'll go dig it up. I learned my lesson on that a long time ago. Um, we have an incredible array of, of wildflowers, and, and when you look at it, you see some of it. Um, I like this shot because you see the foam flowers and you see the trillium discolor, but what you're missing in this shot are the 72 other species that are growing in this picture, right? <laughs> yeah. So it's, there's a lot of diversity there. Like I said, 1,392 species is just in my own home county of Pickens County. So there's apparent diversity and there's hidden diversity. Yes, ma'am. When you were in Chile, did you uh, discover any species previously unknown? To yeah. I was working in such a remote area that it was a two-day raft trip to get in. And I was working in such a remote area that um, when you got there, the birds had never seen human beings in this valley. And so they would just land on your head and pick your hair out of your head to use in their nest. And they'd land on my pad as I was trying to write. And the, even the, um, the cougars had no fear of people and they would walk right in front of you. Um, it was kind of like you know, Eden, it was just amazing because it, it was so remote that literally since the, the um, Patagon Indians had been pushed out of the area, people hadn't been there. It's difficult, it's not easy to get to. It's like rock climbing, rafting, I mean, it was crazy. Uh, unless you had a helicopter, which we did. Um, so when we look around us, there's evident diversity and then there's hidden diversity. So the, the diversity is way better and way bigger than what you see with your eyes and you have to like spend a uh, absorbing yourself in it to really understand what it is. This is um, calicanthus, right? We all know sweet shrub. We see it blooming every spring here. It forms these really odd um, sacks of, of um, seeds in the wintertime. It's not a true capsule, but it's kind of like a capsule. It's like a paper bag full of seeds. If you don't get out there first thing in the fall, you're not going to collect the seeds because there'll be little teeth marks in the edge of the seed and they'll be stolen. And they're stolen by a mouse called a golden mouse. It's a golden mouse's favorite food. And this golden mouse is probably a species you've never seen unless you watch Expeditions with Patrick McMillan on Wednesday nights at 7.30 on SCE TV. But the golden mouse um, has really long fingers because he lives his whole life in the trees, in the bushes. He's arboreal. And he has a prehensile tail like a spider monkey that they can swing on to get out there and gather those seeds. And look at that rich golden color, even the scientific name, acrotomies, means gold mouse in Latin. Isn't that beautiful? Gorgeous creature, yeah. But think about the other things we don't see, the moles. We have three species of moles right here in this county, the hairy tail, the common mole, and the star-nosed mole. Um, and most of them you'll never see. And the small mammals are just incredibly diverse in our area, but you know, you look at all of them and you think they're rats, but they're not. You know, there's a ton of a variety of things, insectivores, shrews, gosh. Um, there's endemics of all these as we move up and down 
in elevation. The bird life that all this stuff, uh, you know, some bird life is hidden and some bird life is evident. And this one's hidden, but it has a very sweet sound. Winter wrens. Have you ever seen a winter wren? Okay, you've seen them? Have you heard them? Okay. Most people haven't seen them, have heard them. They have the best voice, I think, in the spruce fir forest. And they come down to us in the wintertime and go up the Southern Blues Escarpment to places like um, one of the best places guaranteed to see them just any day of the year. Step out of the parking lot at um, Devil's Courthouse and cup your ears and listen downhill and you'll hear them singing. These winter wrens. Um, we have such a wide variety of birds in this area, partly because same reason we have a wide variety of plants, which is there's a large gradient of elevation change from the bottom of the mountain at about six to 800 feet in places like Clemson, South Carolina, to places like the top of the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment, which crests out about 4,000 feet. And then just beyond that, just a couple miles, you can go up to 6,200 feet. So in the distance of only about 40 or 50 linear miles, you can run the gamut of having palmetto trees and an hour and a half drive later, you'll be up at the climate of Hudson Bay, Canada, right? And the great thing about this is it means you can see lots of bird life, you can see lots of plant life, and if you like spring, you can go enjoy spring in February in Clemson, and you can go in the first week of June to Devil's Courthouse and see the same plants blooming, right? As you move up in elevation, the temperature moves down, the humidity moves up. And it, it manifests itself not just in the plants you see, but also in the birds that you see from bottom to top, right? <laughs> Um, there's a lot of endemics in the higher elevations like the spruce fir that crest our hills here on the edge of the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment ecoregion. But we have a really cool population, and this is a member of it, of red crossbill, which have these crossed bills. And we talked about how the bees are made, you know, they're, they're made exactly to fit inside those flowers, and the flowers are made exactly for the bees. And here's a crossbill who has this crossed bill to fit exactly a red spruce cone, right? Except this one doesn't eat red spruce because it only lives on one river valley in the southern Blue Ridge Escarpment, way below where other red crossbills live up in the tops of the mountains, this resident population that breeds about 600 birds along one river valley in the southern Blue Ridge Escarpment feeds on pine and hemlock. And right now, mostly in back, people's backyards, because the hemlock seeds that it formerly depended on are pretty much gone. And so one of my good friends who lives right along this river is probably keeping this population alive by feeding it in the wintertime. But we now know that every one of these little populations around the world may represent its own unique genotype, maybe its own species. It's pretty cool. Right, so everything, you know, squirrels, bears, blah, blah, blah. The other great thing about our habitat here is that it's almost contiguously preserved from Raven County, Georgia in the National Forest to the National Forest of Oconee County to the, the Blue Wall Preserve in Greenville County and the Jocasta Gorges in Pickens County to um, the Green River Preserve to, to um, all of the land that's protected via easements from groups like this one in this area. We have a huge con nearly connected corridor from Hickory Nut Mountain almost down, uh, all the way down in northeastern Georgia. And that allows us to have enough land to have one of the most vibrant bear populations left in the eastern United States. So vibrant that y'all send me bears every year that I have to chase out of the garden. <laughs> Thank you. Um, most of the land up here has really acid soils, and really acid soils are created by really acid rocks, and really acid soils are difficult to make a living in because nutrients aren't very available, and aluminum becomes toxic to the um, root tip growth where plants absorb nu nutrients. So um, we find lots of evergreens growing in these acid soils. So if you ever want to know if your backyard is acid or rich soil, all you got to do is look and see. Do you have mountain laurel? Do you have lots of mountain laurel? If you have lots of mountain laurel, dog hobble, and rhododendron, you have very acid soils, probably on the order of between a pH of four and a pH of five and a half. Really acid, like vinegar acid, okay? Um, these evergreens don't throw away their nutrients at the end of the year. They hold on to them because they're hard to get. And particularly calcium is non-reabsorbable. It's a non-mobile element. So if you shed your calcium in your leaves, you can't pull it in before you get rid of it, right? You can't reuse it. So, Calcium oftentimes is limiting. So most of the common rock in this area is a rock called Henderson Nice, right here on this property. There's tons of this. Um, and then there's also granite. In South Carolina, it's table rock granite, but there's a couple other formations up here in this, in this area. Both of those rocks are the most common rocks in our area, and they weather to produce really acid soils because the minerals in the soil come from the rock that breaks down to form the soil, right? Um, there's lots of orchids. It's not that these areas are boring. They're very cool, but they're very common. 
And so there's lots of orchids there because orchids don't rely on soil pH to get their nutrients. They parasitize fungus to get their nutrients. Orchids are evil. <laughs> right? I, in South Carolina, there's this myth that uh, the lady slipper is endangered, and it's really very, very common. It's just don't transplant it because you can't get it to live. Because it parasitizes the fungus, the plant will survive transplant. The fungus will not. Right? And it depends on the fungus to survive. So even though this is the most common habitat in the area, we do have rare species that have been generated in these common habitats because even the common habitats here um, are unique because of the rainfall and other things, okay? So um, there is a place though, that when I was a kid growing up in Allegheny County, all of our woodlands where I grew up were Acid Cove Forest and, and Pine Oak Heath, okay? And when I moved to South Carolina, I saw in the escarpment mostly Acid Cove Forest and Pine Oak Heath, and I thought that was the most boring place I could ever be because I was so used to it growing up. And I took a trip to a place called East Otoe Valley, in a magical mountain called Watco Mountain one day, about two years after I got, it was the first year I got here, with a guy named Wes Cooler. And he invited me up there and he said, I really, we really want to get our upstate forever involved and we want to preserve this beautiful valley in the base of this mountain. I said, great. I said, can you come up? I was like, I was looking for any excuse possible because I wanted to work in the low country. I had no interest in working in the Blue Ridge. And he said, and I said, okay. I went up. Took us on this walk up this little creek behind this house, and it had rhododendron, mountain laurel, dog hobble, a few dying hemlock trees, white pine, scarlet oak. <laughs> we got done with the, the event with a bunch of other people, and I was supposed to be telling them about how great the plants were, and I was like, this is scarlet oak. Um, we got done with it. Everybody went home, and I said thank you to Wes, and he said, you, I'll show you something behind my house here on the other creek. And I was like, I really got to get back to Clemson. Like, I got stuff to do tomorrow. And then he said, he finally said, please let me show you. I said, there's something wrong with it. Okay. We walked up behind his house up to the top of Watico Mountain and back. And by the time we got back, we'd found nine species that had never been seen in South Carolina before. And I would spend the next four years of my life doing nothing but running up and down <laughs> that mountain. This is what the forest he showed me looked like. It was a canopy of yellow wood, butternut, green ash, and slippery. And underneath it was a carpet of wildflowers. And there wasn't a single evergreen plant to be found. You can imagine when I got up there, this was in October, and I, like the hair on the back of my neck was standing up. And I, like, I, I literally just couldn't get enough. So what we call a rich cove or a basic cove forest. It's hardwood dominated rather than evergreen dominated. There's no conifers. There's low shrub cover. There's little to no iricaceous shrubs, the blueberries and, and um, mountain laurel and those types. And there's very high herb cover and diversity. It's a magical place where you find plants that you otherwise don't find in the, commonly in the south. You don't find a lot of orchids because orchids do better in areas where there's no competition and where they can steal their nutrients from fungus. And so the only orchids you do find up there are three species, or four species, two uh, uh, winter green orchids and then yellow lake slipper, um, and crested coral root, showy orchids being the other, right? Not bad orchids to find. There were tons of plants there. And to understand why this is so special and why it's so magical and why it lends so much of the diversity to our area, you have to understand that these are islands of unusual soil <coughs> surrounded by a very common soil type that's acidic. Right? Most of these basic or rich cove forests come from a rock called amphibolite. It's a dark black rock that we mostly use to pave driveways. Okay? And um, this dark black rock is really high in magnesium, cation, and it's also oftentimes associated with um, higher than normal calcium for these rocks. And just like we were saying, um, the magic comes from the fact that suddenly you're, you have a habitat where nutrients aren't limiting, where there's lots of nutrients available and where calcium is available, and you can stick it into your leaves and you can throw it away and you don't have to worry about it, right? I convey this as like the most common community in the Southern Appalachians is an acidic cove forest. I grew up in a family, I have 16, uh, 16 of us, kids, um, Appalachian, 
And guess what? I never had a new character. Right? They're all hand-me-downs. We had to conserve, just like evergreen species. If I'd grown up like Paris Hilton, <laughs> she doesn't worry about wearing a pair of shoes once and throwing them away, right? It's the difference between growing in a basic cove on Amphibolite and in an acid cove on something like Henderson Nice. So the area of Wadaco Mountain is located, if we look at the geologic map, in this huge band of what we call Poor Mountain Formation Amphibolite. So we set about doing a survey back in 2002, this is, uh, of this area. And there was already a ton of stuff known from that area. When I looked at the map and I plotted out all the rare species that were known, there were a lot of them. And they were going to do some clear cuts here, the DNR, and they were going to um, put a, a, a walking path through the area. And they hired a consultant to go through and see if there was anything rare along the route that they were going to construct. And he said, no, there's not. And so the route they were going to construct, they used the existing database, and they ran it right up here and right up Wadaco and right over here, where there really wasn't any reports of rare plants. But I knew the rock type, and I knew it was up there, so it forced me to get a voice for plants. Before this project, I didn't speak in front of people. Before this project, I had no interest in speaking to people. I'd sit in the basement of a museum looking at plants all day, every day. And I was terrified to get up and voice something. But because this thing was at risk, I had to. What I found was that. What I found, if you look at it close, was over 500 different um, populations of rare plants. Um, what I found was old growth forests. 975 species of plants on this one mountain alone. That's 70% of the total, 70.01% 70 of the total of 1,392 species that are known from Pickens County, South Carolina. Um, the magic of this place is that there's some acid places, there's some basic places, and there's some in-between places. It's a mosaic. And so instead of having one species of hearts of Buston, you had three, one of which had never been seen in Carolina before. We had 64 species of ferns and gametophytes known from that, that site. You like trillion, but how many places do you know where you can see seven species in one cove? Right? How many species of trillium there, by the way? One. <laughs> Lots of different color forms to trillium regelii. Um, but vasii, maybe a new species of trillium there. Um, and the common ones, like Trillium catesbii, faded Trillium, which is um, common in our area, Cuneatum. Over 500, 534 new element occurrence reports, uh, 18 species that have never been previously documented from South Carolina before, like golden seal, um, even some things that are ridiculous. How did they find this spot? This is what I said with Ozark bunch flower. I reported it and did the report for DNR and stood up in front of people just like this and talked to them passionately about how we need to preserve it because it's the only known site for Ozark bunch flower in South Carolina. And where does Ozark bunch flower normally go? In the Ozarks. This is a special place. Problem with Ozark bunch flowers, you can't tell it from the common bunch flower except by flower color. And I just assumed because it was on growing on rich soil, it was Ozark bunch flower. And I really stuck my neck out and I was lying. And then I finally did a tour in July for the Color Week conference up there with a bunch of experts. And I was like, oh God, do I go up here and see? Because I'd never seen one flower. And we found one flower and it had the red flowers. And by God, it was Ozark bunch flower. Isn't that cool? Two new species that were new to science that had never been seen before Solidiga fossibus. Ambrosia Prochiorum, named after Richard Prochet, if any of you guys know him. He'd kill me for showing that picture of him with a gut, but. Um. So, lots of the daphic um, changes mean lots of diversity acid places, intermediate places, basic places. We have it all. And we also have um, what is the worst of all circumstances for conservation, but a really unique habitat in our mountain bogs. Well, cataract fens and, and mountain fens or bogs, we call them, where things like mountain sweet pitcher plant grow, right? These are habitats just like, um, just like our, our um, Piedmont prairies are mostly disappearing because of land use changes, because we no longer graze mountain bogs up where I'm from, and because uh, climate change lost the regaining of the Rocky Mountain instead of the all kinds of things that have been going on to hammer these habitats. And they're mostly 
cool things grow there that need sunlight and soggy uh, waterlogged soil to grow. And if we don't manage them, they grow up into trees. So we lose things like the bog turtle, right? Which is found in this area. Um, in my area, cranberries. American bog asphodel is a species uh, that today grows in New Jersey, used to be known from South Carolina, but there was another species that went extinct before we knew it was a species that was only found in Henderson County, North Carolina, called, um, John Small called it a Baba Montana, and its new name is Narthesium Montanum, and it's only known from herbarium specimens because the great bogs at Flat Rock had been converted and drained and altered before the time we realized that it was a new species. So a lot of pressure here. Luckily, because of all this rainfall, we have a habitat that is able to stay open even without people keeping it open, and that's what we call cataract fens. And we have more of them than anywhere else in the whole world right here. The Southern Appalachian Cataract Fen is essentially just a feature of the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment ecoregion. All that rainfall washes water from rock, washes from steep rock faces, and it's constantly flowing down the edge, so we get a little linear bog that provides lots of habitat for rare things. And sometimes those bogs, like the one I'm showing you here on Pinnacle Mountain in South Carolina, have high pH water running over granite rock because they started in amphibolite and carried the nutrients down, which provide habitats for some really rare things um, that we just simply don't find anywhere else in the southern Manica region. These have, provide habitat for lots of coastal plain plants that we reach up into the mountains and some plants that are only found in the mountain region but are related to coastal plain things because they've been open and they've been living on this corridor to this unique place for so, so long. So sum it all up. You got it? How about do it again? You got it? Is, is the force controlling, completely controlling this type of force? It is. It is. Soil and lack of fire in this case, and, and, and water, and everything that we talked about, competition, space competition, all these things work together, all these interactions, okay? So we know about the things that make the place the place, but how special really is the place? Okay, well here's a plant that tells us how special this place is. This is a Coney Bells, right? Found by a man who didn't name it, named for a man who never saw it, by a man who couldn't find it, right? A great story about its uh, discovery, loss, rediscovery, and then loss, and then rediscovery again, right? Found by a name who never named it, named for a man who never saw it, okay? It has a very limited range. It's only found around the shores of Lake Jocassee. Um, and at one, and one other spot at the very top end of our southern Blue Ridge Escarpment up in McDowell County, North Carolina. And that's it, nowhere else in the world, entirely endemic to the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment ecoregion, and only two tiny populations. There are other Coney Bells, though, in Eastern Europe, because we shared a connection in the past. Coney Bells probably spread all the way across the continent at one time, 35 million years ago or so, <laughs> who knows how long ago, Then we call the tertiary climatic optimum. It's probably across the northern hemisphere because forests like the ones we see when we look out of Wanna Creek Preserve here extended all the way across the northern hemisphere of the globe at that time. But they were broken up. And all throughout the rest of North America, a Coney Bells went extinct. It maintained itself in Eastern Asia and it maintained itself right around Lake Jocassee here. When did uh, Tom's Creek. Six of them were destroyed when they flooded Jocassee. Yeah. But they were never away from there. There's some places where they've been planted and reported native, but they're not really native there. So why just that area? Well, there's lots of diversity here, but it's not just the things that are here, the numbers of the things that are here, it's the things that are here that are diverse. More diversity of salamanders per square inch than anywhere else in North America is right here. Great Smoky Mountain says they got it, I say we got it, one of theirs is a lie, all mine are true. <laughs> The same number reported, but they've never seen a green salamander that they can verify in the Great Smoky Mountains. So I say, we got it. Um, why do we have so many salamanders? Salamanders, we have the highest diversity anywhere. Trillium, we have the highest diversity per square inch. Um, seven species in one code, but look at the diversity of trillium. Some species that still have yet to be described. This is a species of trillium that is endemic to Polk, Henderson, County, North Carolina, and Greenville County, South Carolina, and nowhere else on planet Earth, and we still don't even have a name for it. There's still diversity we're finding in things that are as showy as this. 
It looks like Catesby's trillion blooms a month earlier and it's tiny. Beautiful. Salamanders and trillium share one thing in common. They like that moist habitat, but they share another thing in common. They really stink at migration. <laughs> Our salamanders are lungless, you know. They don't have lungs. Vertebrate without lungs. Did you know that? The majority of them. Plethodonidae is the family, the lungless salamander family. And I always thought they did have lungs when I was a kid sticking them on a fish hook because when you catch spring lizards when you're a kid, you look at them. And they look like they're breathing. They do something called gular fluttering. And I get better and better at it every year. It's, my gular region keeps expanding. I love it. It makes it a more effective presentation. But you know, you guys seen it, right? You ever seen a salamander doing that? Yeah. Yeah, I thought they were bringing air in and out of the lungs. If not, they bring it into their buccal cavity here because there's lots of little uh, capillaries there. And then their skin is wet. And there's capillaries all over that wet skin that allow all their entire surface of their body and their mouth to act like a lung to exchange carbon dioxide and oxygen through their skin. But there's a trick to that. You have to stay wet. So they stay underground during the day. And they're fossorial. They only come out at night. And you have no idea until you go out with a flashlight in these forests how many salamanders there really are. They have the highest density biomass per square inch of any vertebrate in our forest. They're way more important than bear and deer and coyotes and doing what they do because there's way more of them by weight in our forest than any other vertebrate. And the great thing about, well, one of the horrible things and great things about for us is that um, somebody studied this family of, of salamanders out in California, the Trachyceps, in the same, gene, uh, same family, the famous salamanders. They followed them around for 19 years and found that in 19 years it moved a meter. <laughs> a meter. They don't move far because they can't. They can't traverse large distances across dry habitats, and they can't stand climate change changing the humidity of their environment. They're barometers for stability. The trillium produce these seeds that, just like this bloodroot seed, have a fleshy aril attached called an eliosome that attracts ants, which carry away the seeds and eat that fleshy body and dump the seeds in the forest floor leaf litter. And when's the last time you saw an ant run from here to Michigan? <laughs> Only on the windshield of a car, right? Okay. So trillium take about 10 years in the wild to go from seed to um, an adult plant. This is a, a first year. This is the second year. The first year the seed sprouts doesn't make a leaf. The second year it makes a leaf. The third year it makes a little larger leaf. The fourth year it can make a little bit larger leaf. And then maybe a, the fourth year or fifth year will have three leaves. And seven to 10 years later, it's finally making a flower and spreading itself. And the farthest it can move in 10 years is about 100 meters. So we know something about climate change now. We know that when climate change occurs, it pushes things way faster than we thought because we used to think climate change happened over eons and it happens over decades. And if you're moving 100 meters every decade, you can't move north and south fast enough to accommodate for the climate change. But if you're moving from Clemson, South Carolina, up to the top of of um, Devil's Courthouse, you only have to move about 60 miles, not from here to Hudson Bay, right? And there's so much rise and, and drop so quickly there that it makes it a magical place for maintaining diversity. You can move up and down to accommodate the climate instead of north and south. Not only that, but because our mountains run north, south mostly until they get to here, they've escaped the fate of Europe. You know, wonder why there's so few things in Europe. It's not because people have totally screwed it up, and it's part of it, but it's the fact that Alps run east west entirely, right? So when the glaciers came down, they met glaciers coming down the slopes of the mountains, and all the diversity in northern Europe was squished in between, right? Here, when the glaciers came down to about here, um, they would. All, everything was able to escape without running into an east-west barrier. It's important. But our gorges themselves, the very blue highways I talk about bisecting this blue wall, are probably more important than anywhere else because there's rise and fall from here all the way to the Adirondacks. But the Adirondacks don't generate the diversity that we have here of these things that have had to escape climate change in the past. And we're sure that the climate changed here so how do they survive, even moving up and down? They survive by going into the one thing we have more of than anywhere else in the Southern Blue Ridge. We've got gorges. 
got these magical places like along East Atoe Narrows where you can walk from the top of the hill in the wintertime, it'll be 16 degrees, get to the bottom, it's 32. You walk in the summertime, it's 94 up on that ridge, you walk to the bottom, it's 74. The sun never hits the bottom of the, of the uh, gorge and the wind never blows because it's protected. And that water buffers the habitat too, right? Microclimate that have provided a habitat for tropical ferns like the one we talked about to grow underneath plants from Canada, right? In the same spot. It's made this place a refuge for life through times of change. So to sum it up, lots of different geology and soils, lots of altitudinal change, cool climate with lots of rainfall, steep slopes, aspects, and microclimates we just talked about and past climate change. The current landscape pattern is no more than 5,000 years old. And the one thing we always forget, the human touch, right? They've all worked together to produce this place that's unbelievable. And just think about the fact that maybe the reason that there are sugar maples today in Vermont is because they've sought refuge during the last ice age in the gorges of Polk County. All through the Pleistocene, our mountains have breathed in and exhaled diversity. And every time they do, things are changing and they're adapting. And you're breeding diversity that stays and leaves and comes home again. Right? Fascinating. Think about how those genes move. We've done a great job preserving this part. We've done a really lousy job of preserving everything to get into it. This is where places like the Conservancy can come play a role that will support life into the future. We are in the middle of climate change, period. No matter where it's coming from, we are in the middle of climate change. We plant palmettos, not rhododendrons now at the South Carolina Botanical Garden. I have 694 species of plants from West Texas growing in the South Carolina Botanical Garden, just fine. 20 years ago, we couldn't have done that. Our temperatures raised more than 10 degrees on average in the winter and the summer. Our rainfall's gotten way more unpredictable. We're in the middle of climate change. If plants and animals can't get into and out of this wonderful place that you hold a piece of in your hands, if we don't preserve those routes, if we don't preserve this place, that beautiful inhale and exhale diversity that's kept this continent alive in the past, be broken. So you have a part to play in that. Don't be the cigarette in the mouth. It has to go through the backyards. In a place like South Carolina, only 11% of our state is in public ownership. Right? The Savannah River Corridor and the Broad River Corridor are your two lifelines into and out of the Southern Blue Ridge Escarpment. Those are so important. They're not just preserved here, they're preserved there, and the in-between spaces and the private spaces that we manage, John, are managed in a way that provides an appropriate habitat for things to migrate through. The most important job in this coming climatic event that we're in the middle of, not coming, it's here, it's incipient, it's here, is the role of places like the Conservancy. That's why it's so important. That's why I'm here talking to you today because I believe in what you're a part of. And I want you to be a voice that says we have to connect. We have to preserve. It's good for everything. It's good for the economic growth. This is a problem with national, from national security to the creativity of our youth that this place, these things, be part of our continued experience. That's my son. <laughs> that was my son at 12 years old. <laughs> my son's 27. Um, I want you to think about the last thing, and I know I'm going on and on and on, but I hope you'll take some of it away with you, but there's the last thing that I want to say about this thing being a crucible of life through times of change. Remember that, it's a crucible of life we're preserving. It's a crucible of all life. It's not just the diversity, and it's not just the salamanders. But it's the human touch, it's your spirit, it's your way of communing, of centering, of receiving whatever it is that you get, whoever it is that you worship, whatever it is that you call 
your home. It grounds you. My son was raised outside. Today, most kids aren't. They go outside when they're in trouble, right? Um, we were poor as could be coming up. So his only avenues for fun was going out with me to places that were free, that were public spaces that he could visit and he could play in and he could learn. And so he was never as happy as he was right there. 27 years old today. He's the world's expert on how bison change um, the ecosystem when they're brought back onto the landscape in the northern Great Plains. He's currently working as a research scientist for the University of Florida now in um, Archibald Biological Station down in central Florida. And he's, I couldn't be prouder. He, um, he and I, poverty when, we were, when he was a kid, struggling for me to get through school, for his mom to get through school, and then the collapse of our family and me becoming a single parent. And you know, even though Nick was 17, almost 18 at the time, that was such a huge thing. You know, it always is. There's nothing worse in the whole world than that. And when my son would get mad and when he would just couldn't handle it anymore, couldn't handle just the situation that was going on. He knew I was frustrated. He knew I was upset. He'd tear away in that big old red truck of his down the road. And I'd just die of worry. I'm just squished. Have you guys experienced that? You worry about your kid? Not knowing what in the world he would do. But after about the second time he did it, I didn't worry. Because my kid would go out, and 30 minutes or an hour later, I'd get a text, a picture of Twin Falls up in the gorges. <laughs> and all it would say down there is, don't worry, Dad. Everything will be OK. Oh, yeah. I don't care if you care about golden mice. <laughs> Trillium, Coney Bells, you better. <laughs> but how do you put a price tag on that? How do you replace that place that you actually go to commune with God? Pretty special. Must be something about waterfalls. This got me. <laughs> Married a high school sweetheart who knew me pretty well back then. And when I went up for her first date to the mountains, she's from the same place I grew up on, the Blue Ridge Escarpment, but the northern one, not the southern one. And she wanted to meet at a waterfall. I was done. <laughs> I owe this place so much. It's why I'll never turn down an opportunity to come speak about it. And it's why I'm so thankful for what you do. If you are not a member of the Conservancy, please consider joining. Um, please thank Babs for the wonderful use of this facility and for doing what their family has done. and steal some of what I taught you today and use it to empower people to understand that this, isn't, this isn't a right or this isn't a thing that you can judge right or wrong. It's all right and it's all good for the future of us and the future of our country. Thank you. Um, it has been a blessing to have this place and to have all of you coming for these years and this is not his first time here and will not be his last time. <laughs> but what Patrick just said about his son Nick and about what we can do. Um, Bob and I were blessed that we could do this and we're just blessed that we can share it and so forth. But right now in Polk County, we have a chance, we have an opportunity to honor this man and what he believes in in a way that is a kind of miracle. Those of you who've lived here a while know that before the recession, there was a developer who had a plan to take our little White Oak Mountain and put about 750 homes on it. And we were, um, it 
that the timing was right, that the economy got bad, and he had to stop. And then by the time the economy was picking up again, it still wasn't fast enough. And so he offered to, well, I mean, he would have offered it to pack, but we didn't have any way to do that. So we worked with the Carolina Mountain Land Conservancy, who have such a wonderful staff to go after grants and so forth. And, and loans. And so CMLC went out and borrowed the money along with a wonderful gift from um, Fred and Alice Sandback. Some of you know who they are. They live out, they live in Salisbury, but he, he's the, his money came from the snapback with Sandback powder. <laughs> And uh, he happened to be Warren Beatty's roommate in college, and so he got some good advice about him. That's what he and long and short, he has been a great gift to our state, giving money and protecting land. So he gave $600,000 to our county to start protecting this land. But we need you, and gift from you know $10 to $10,000, whatever you feel you could give to, to Send it to PAC or send it to CMLC, and it will be used to help fund saving that mountain and providing exactly what you're talking about. Because it's, uh, it's diversity of... It's amphibolite, too, and, just and like Guadaco Mountain that we just talked about. Yeah. Crested, the white crested iris, which is... Mm -hmm. in we have yeah. lots of species up there. But besides that, what we have is it's right between... It's right next to the middle school, where our kids will have really for the first time, a space within their environment to go walking in the woods, to go and learn the things that we love and that we believe can make a profound difference in our soul, in our spirit, in our psychology. You know, the last child in the woods is not what we want to be responsible for. So if you can, dig deep so we can go high. Thank you. Thank you.